So I'm going to hit the lights and start. So hi, my name's Jan. I work at the small company called Duxboard, and I'll be talking about Postgres on the wire. Uh, for those of you re-watching that, or if you just want to follow the slides, the slides are up there. You can download them, and you can get the source for the slides from there if you want to you know, fix them up and, and pass them as your own. Uh, so Postgres on uh, the wire. Sorry. This one, yeah. <laughs> we'll have these slides on the website. All the slides will be uploaded to the schedule. Find the talk in the schedule. There should be a link from the talk. OK. So uh, Postgres on the wire. Uh, I'm not actually going to talk about the wire. Uh, this is the outline of the talk as is. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about a bit about how the Postgres protocol is structured, uh, what are the, the basic concepts. Then I'm going to go into how the messages are sent back and forth, what are the types of messages, what's the framing. Uh, then we're going to talk about sending queries, because one of the more useful things you can do with the Postgres protocol is send queries to the database and get results. Uh, and then I'm going to try to go over some less known features or, or some things are outside of the typical query response cycle. So frame format. Uh, first of all, let's start with protocol versions. Uh, there are several versions of the Postgres Cure protocol. And you might see on some slides, I'm going to call it Phoebe, which is for short for front end, back end. So sometimes uh, people say Phoebe when they mean the Postgres protocol. It's, it's, it's a term you might run into. Uh, so the version 2.0 got introduced in 1999. If I haven't mistaken my git log queries. Uh, and actually, the release before that only added protocol versioning. Uh, and version 3.0, which is the current version, got added in 2003. So I'm going to focus on 3.0, because uh, it's been around a while. Uh, but in some places, I'm going to try to highlight differences between 2.0 and 3.0, because 2.0 is still used from time to time. and uh, I'm sure some of you poor devils are on enterprise systems that still have to speak to zero. Uh, and the fun fact is that the server still speaks one zero. So if you hack your client to, to negotiate to use protocol version one zero, it's still going to work. Uh, so talk about backwards compat. And three zero uh, added some new features, which makes it worthwhile. Uh, the extended query protocol, which I'm going to go into detail in the query part of the talk. Uh, copy got better, and uh, in general, it just feels m much more structured, organized. The, it's much more, kind of feels like more standardized, like someone thought everything through and just made everything work more or less the same. Uh, so uh, first of all, the protocol starts with uh, a client connecting to Postmaster with the, the, the main PostgreSQL process. Uh, as soon as the postmaster receives a connection, it forks off a process to handle the protocol. So the actual protocol parsing and, and everything that has to do with the protocol happens in a separate backend. Uh, this means that uh, if anything goes awry with the protocol, you won't crash the postmaster. You will crash the backend, which is bad. But still, it's better than crashing the postmaster. The postmaster does not touch bytes that come from the network. Uh, the other, uh, the other thing that's, that this means is that authentication is done after the process is forked. So this means you, without any authentication, just with an open port, you can force the postmaster to fork, which is, well, it's, uh, it's kind of an expensive operation. But then again, you're not supposed to have your postmaster port open to, to the wide internet, so that's probably fine. Uh, and this also means that the, the, the protocol and uh, it goes over one TCP connection, and it's intimately connected with the backend that's, that you're talking to. So connection and backend are kind of the same thing. If one goes away, the other one goes away. If you close the connection, the process that's handling it will die. Uh, but it might first have to notice that the connection has been closed, which means that just closing the connection will not necessarily immediately terminate the query that's being run. 
this means that, for instance, if you run something and it kind of locked up everything and it's using all the resources, just killing the client will not necessarily stop the query from being executed. Uh, so uh, the frame format, this is the, the, the very basic thing. Uh, almost all frames are, look like that. So uh, they have one character, ASCII identifier, which identifies which kind of a frame is that. Then they have a 32-bit length, and then the payload. And the payload is different depending on what, what frame are we talking about. Uh, sometimes there's no payload, and, uh, but, but basically it, it, it works like that. So parsing is relatively simple. You look at the first byte, you say, oh, this is message foo. Then you get the length, and then you know how, much, how many bytes you need to read, and then you know how to interpret them because you know the frame type. Uh, there's an exception to this, and uh, the so-called startup packet starts with the length, followed by the protocol versions, a 32-bit integer, and then the payload. So uh, the startup packet uh, kind of doesn't have a, a type because the very first piece of data that the postmaster receives is treated to be, is, is interpreted to be the startup packet, right? So you, you know it's the startup packet because this is the first thing you got on a connection. Uh, so let's, let's see how the startup packet looks like. Uh, you have your length, you have your protocol version, and then in version 3.0, you have a series of name value pars. Uh, so you have a, a name, the name of the value, then a null byte, then the value, then a null byte, then the name, null, value, null, and it goes on at, uh, until it, uh, it reaches the final null. And of course, the length needs to add up to, to what the length header said. Um, the, in protocol 2.0, it looked different. The startup packet for 2.0 is fixed size. There's a, there's a fixed number of bytes. So you can't really fit, well, you can fit only a certain number of options in there. Uh, in 3.0, there's no real limit. The startup packet can be as big as, as you want. Uh, and then uh, about the key and values, why key values? Some of those are special, are important, like user or database. Like if one of those fields is user, uh, the, the backend will know, the, the process handling the connection will know which database you're trying to connect to. Uh, you need to be connected as a user. You can't have an anonymous connection. The startup packet needs to specify a user. If not, uh, the connection will get closed. Um, the database is not really, well, you have to have a database, but since it defaults to the user, you just have to send the username. You don't really have to, you, you don't really have to send the, the database name. And there's a number of special keys that are interpreted specially, like options, which are actually uh, in the options field. You can send uh, command line switches for the backend process. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm not really going to go into that, just that some keys are a bit special, and the rest are just GUCs. So any GUC that you can set, you can send it in the startup packet, and then the connection will use those GUCs when, when you actually go, yep? Uh, network, network. Uh, so, so there's the startup packet, and then this is a, a regular data packet. Like I said, starts with an identifier, just it's one byte, it's always seven bit clean, eight bit clean, right? It's, it's an ASCII identifier, uh, and then there's the payload. What follows is, for instance, you can't send a query that's larger than one gigabyte in one go. So if you have uh, an insert statement with a bazillion values, you, you can't really send more than one gigabyte, if not for other reasons, like sanity, then because it just won't fit in a query packet. Uh, and then the payload, how you interpret it, depends on the type. So how does the startup sequence work? Like from the initial TCP connection, or the initial uh, Unix domain socket connection, because as you know, the protocol works over TCP IP or over Unix domain sockets. It's exactly the same. It looks the same. Uh, when you connect, you send the startup packet, and then you wait. The, the backend can either ask for authentication or tell you you're, you're free to enter. This depends on the PGHBA configuration. So if the backend decides uh, this connection is good because, for instance, you've configured trust for, for this net block or you just configured trust for your entire database or whatnot, uh, 
the, the server will send a frame uh, of a type authentication OK, and then you know you're good to go. If not, it will send an authentication request. And there are actually several types of um, authentication requests. And uh, it depends on the PGHBA configuration. So the, the backend knows, oh, for this user and this database and this net block, uh, and uh, so I need this kind of authentication. And he's going to ask you, so yeah, authenticate yourself. Uh, and there are several kinds. Like I said, the most com I guess the most commonly used ones are plain text or MD5 password. We're going to go into detail about how MD5 passwords get sent because it's rather interesting. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the thing is that it's up to the server to require a planar encrypt or uh, MD5. So this means that if you do PSQL your server, then the server might decide, hey, give me your plain text password. And PSQL won't really give you any it, it will know that the password will be sent in plain text, but you won't really know from the interface. So theoretically, an evil server or a man in the middle attacker could swap the, the, the frame, and then kind of you would unwittingly send the plain text password out to the, to the server. It's not a big deal, I guess. It's a, it's a fairly contrived, uh, convoluted uh, scenario, but you might reasonably think that PSQL could tell you, OK, the password you're going to enter is going to be sent on like plain text and not uh, hashed over the network. And there are different, there are more advanced kinds of auth. So the server can ask for, for GSS API authentication or SSPI or other Windows things that I don't really know about. But yeah. So MD5, uh, just because this is the most used or, or common way of authenticating just a password. Uh, the authentication request for MD5 starts with an identifier that says, this is an auth request for MD5. Then the length, uh, then, uh, well, actually, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it says, this is an auth request, then the length, then the type, meaning this is an MD5 auth request, and then a salt. And the client, what it does is it hashes the, the password and the username, and then the hashes, the hash, and the salt prepends an MD5 string and sends that off. Uh, and this is how, this, this is what the server receives, and this is how it decides whether you're authenticated or not. Uh, so why salt, right? Uh, the salt is there to prevent replay attacks, right? Because without salt, if you, if you would just send the hash of your, of your password, then an eavesdropper on the connection could would be able to reuse the same packet to log in as you uh, the next time. If in, in this scenario, uh, he won't be able to later on reuse the same hash to log in as you, because you, he would need to, to have the salt. Uh, and why the double hashing, right? Why it's doing hashing here and then another hash there? Uh, and this is because the server can only store this hash. This means that you don't need to keep plain text passwords on the server uh, so that if someone steals your database and, or, or gets access to the catalogs that contain the passwords, they, won't, they will only get the hash and not the plain text password. Although, if you think about it, the hash is, is, is as good as a password uh, as a means to enter the, to connect to the, to the server, right? So if someone steals your hashes, they can impersonate you, they can connect as you, but at least they don't have the actual string that you've reused on million services. Yep. It died. That's sad. <laughs> okay. Batteries. But I can keep them. Oh, I got this one. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's like it's broken. That's good. Sorry about uh, that. Can you still hear him? Hello. <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, another. The, the problem that will happen is it won't get, the audio won't get recorded. Uh, audio will be recorded. Yeah. The second, yeah. the second might do recording for audio. That's what yeah. We're taking that second. Right. But it's, it is recording now, right? It was just. Uh, yeah, this one is. It's the blue mic. Ah. They do one recording. On? University. I see. One recording. Do we have so what battery? should I do? <laughs> <laughs> you put both in. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm no way. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we're good? Okay. 
parameter status. Uh, that's an interesting packet. It gets sent uh, by the server and it informs the client about some parameters that the server deems important to transmit to the client. And uh, so it's, it's a very simple packet, just name value. Uh, and the, the parameters that get sent are, for instance, server version, right? So the client knows what the exact version of the server is talking to. Uh, some are important to be sent immediately on connection, like client encoding, because client encoding is critical to be able to escape text strings correctly, because, uh, because you can kind of line up multibyte characters to eat the quote that's, that's closing, a, that, that, that quotes a text value. So if you're confused about client encoding, you might not do escaping correctly. And this is why uh, the, the libpq or, uh, or other client drivers require a, a reference to the connection to do escaping because they need the, the value that got sent uh, on, on startup. Uh, and some are important for the client, like, like date style, so the client needs to know if the dates that are coming in a textual form are uh, month, day, year, or day, year, month, or whatnot. Uh, the important thing and the, and the curious thing is that every time any of those parameters gets changed, the parameter status message gets pushed down the connection to the client. So this means if you're connected, we, we can try to see uh, this happening later on when, we, when we'll see the actual protocol running. Uh, when you change any of those, on the next occasion when the server has something to say to the client, it will also include a parameter status message. Because things like date style can be changed cluster-wide and then if you reload your server, it will change for the current session, right? So you need to, you need to have the client know that. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, how the, the initial exchange works from the startup packet, then either an auth request uh, or a notification <coughs> OK message from the server, then the, the client optionally can send password message if, if it didn't see an auth OK. Then a bunch of parameter status, then something called backend key data. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. And then uh, a message that's called ready for query, which means uh, I've entered query processing mode. Now you, we're, you know, we're done with the uh, initial courting. Let's get down to business. Uh, so this is, uh, this is like the basic things. Uh, there's, uh, there are a few more things that can happen in initial connection setup, like SSL. Uh, if you think about it, it's, real, it's rather weird that Postgres has a mo well, if you configure it with SSL support to listen on SSL, it will also uh, accept plain text connection on the same port. So there has to be a moment where you, where you choose, we're, we're speaking plain text, or no, we're switching to SSL encrypted communication. And this is done with a dummy startup packet. So you send a startup packet with a special protocol code, because if you, if you compare, the startup bucket has a protocol version as the second field, right? Uh, the SSL negotiation packet looks like a startup bucket, but the, the protocol field is repurposed to, to be the, the negotiation code. It's actually, uh, if your PSQL client sends 3.0, uh, if you're negotiating SSL, it sends uh, protocol version one, two, three, four, six, Seven, eight. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. Yeah. So something that uh, you'd never see as, as a real protocol version. It's repurposed to, signif to mean I want to do SSL. And then the server writes back a single byte that says, uh, yes, w let's do SSL. I'm, I'm down for it. Or no, I'm not doing SSL. Or you can get an error message if the server is so old that uh, it didn't even include. SSL in the in compile time. It's, it doesn't mean it hasn't been linked with SSL. It means that it never even knew about SSL because it, it predates the addition of the possibility of doing that. And then you'll just get an error saying, that's not a protocol version I can speak. Uh, because it will interpret the, the startup packet as a, as, a, as a regular startup packet. And then the client can decide. If the server says, no, I won't do SSL with you, you can say, well, I don't want to speak to you if you're not doing SSL, or you can continue, and then there are options that the client can provide for that. So th this is a place, for instance, where the client can choose whether to continue talking with the server that 
for one reason or another refuses to do SSL or just keep at it. So SSL works like this. You get an SSL negotiation packet, then you get the single byte, which is, uh, I guess, it's uh, supported, not supported, or an error message. If you get supported, uh, you can go to the SSL handshake. And here open SSL kicks in, you get all the setup, the, the, the connection gets SSL. And then you transmit your regular trans uh, startup packet, this time encrypted. So from, from down here, everything is encrypted. Right, so it's, it's kind of a simple way to, to have SSL and, not, and non SSL on the same port. Uh, right. Uh, now, there's another kind of startup packet that's called the cancel request. Uh, what happens is that there's yet another fake protocol version that means uh, I want to cancel my running query. Uh, this means that in order to cancel queries, you actually have to open another connection to the postmaster. So if a client is connected and it has sent a query and is being processed, in order to cancel it, you can't just send another connection on the same TCP uh, stream. You have to open another TCP IP connection and send a separate cancel request, and then hopefully the query will, will terminate and you will get back an error code without having to wait for it to complete. Although you don't really have any you don't really have any guarantees. You can just, you open the connection, you write the bytes, you go away, and then you, you wait what happens. Of course, you can always just close the connection, and, and that's also an option. Uh, so this works like that. You send a, a cancel request, which has this dummy cancel, this dummy protocol version that's actually a cancel code. It says which PID the process, uh, which is the, what, what's the PID of the process running the query you want to cancel? which supposedly is, your, is the PAD of your connection process, and the secret key, uh, which prevents other people from canceling your queries. And the secret key is actually transferred in this backend key data message. Right? So this is how the client gets a secret key for their connection to cancel their own queries. Uh, now, this Theoretically, and it's been discussed on the mailing list, is open to replay attacks. So if someone can eavesdrop your cancellation packet, they will be able to cancel all further, all, all further queries you do, you do on this connection until the next connection where, where the key gets generated again. But uh, in theory, it, uh, replay attacks are possible. Uh, in theory, you could send cancel requests on SSL connections, so you could do this dance Negotiate SSL, and then instead of this side of packet, send cancellation, and then your, your secret code gets transmitted over SSL. But for instance, libpq doesn't do that. If you, if you use the, the, the official C library for Postgres, it would just send it in plain text, regardless of if the connection is SSL or not. Uh, so most applications will send their cancel key in plain, which again, it's probably not a big deal, but there's, it, it's something to be aware of. Uh, errors. Errors in general in Postgres are, uh, are uh, notified or are signaled with an error response message. Uh, that's a list of key value parts again. Uh, in version 2.0, it was just a string, and then you had to parse it or, or do some kind of processing. Uh, in 3.0, it is. Uh, it has structure, so there are, there are fields for uh, detail, hint, the actual message, the severity. You get all those, uh, and the client can, can display them and process them in a more structured way. Uh, you actually also get the source file and the line in the source file where the error originated, which means that you can fingerprint uh, Postgres versions without even being authenticated to the server, because if you just send a garbage, it will tell you, oh, that's garbage. It will give you an error message saying, that's garbage. But you will know what's the source file and the source line where the message got generated. So you know the exact version uh, of Postgres. Because between releases, the, the code gets shifted ever so slightly. So you can, you can usually know which version are you talking to just by looking at the error message. And there's a Metasploit module that, that just does this, that allows you to fingerprint uh, a server without having authentication on it. 
So that's, and the errors, these are messages that get used for any kind of error, authentication error, query error, anything. Uh, so tools, what do you use? How, how do you look at the protocol? Uh, so TCP dump or, or T sharp work, you can just dump the, the traffic on the interface and, and look at the bytes. Wireshark has, a, has support for, for deparsing the protocol, so you can just fire up Wireshark and then you can click and it'll tell you this kind of message and, and it'll show you all the fields, uh, but only for 3.0. For 2.0, uh, at least my, my version of my copy of Wireshark didn't work. Uh, and there's a tool that I found when I, when I was preparing the talk that's called PG Shark. It's a Perl tool that, that, that does protocol parsing and some other nice things. Uh, and uh, just, just to let you know, okay, as I think the tool is it's not widely known and it's useful, it's, it's nice. Uh, it has several binaries that do things with, with uh, protocol captures. So you can either capture live protocol messages and display uh, like the, the debug, the, the, the deparsed frames. It can write out a summary from a capture file, like you've run this many select statements, or you've had this, man, these, this many connections. So if you don't really have access, you can always, uh, you know, to the log, or you can't change the logging, uh, you can just dump the, the protocol, and then use PGSharp to, to analyze it. And it does support protocol version two, uh, which none of the other tools do. do. So uh, we can try to take a look at a dump, I'm gonna start jumping traffic from my, my local instance. I'm gonna run, uh, I am going to run PGS debug, which just prints out the protocol, right? And then I'm gonna connect to my local instance. Uh, notice that I'm using uh, TCP explicitly, because otherwise it would go over domain, Unix domain sockets and, and I wouldn't see them on the, in, in the packet dump and I'm disabling SSL because otherwise I won't be able to, to see anything. So I will connect and stuff appears here. Right, so as you can see, there's a bunch of parameter status messages like server encoding, UTF, uh, eight. Uh, server version, 9113. And so on and so on and so on and then it ends with uh, backend key data with the PAD of my connection and the secret key and then it says, ready for query, type idle. Uh, I don't know, we're not go doing great on time, so I'm not gonna play with it more. Uh, we might just revisit this later. Querying. Uh, there are two protocols for, for actually querying the database, but before we go into them, uh, let's talk about binary versus text data. The data Postgres sends can be either text or binary. Uh, the Every type has a text and a binary representation. So an integer, uh, it can be, can be represented as text, like the, the decimal notation of the integer, or as a network order integer. Same for floats, for, for everything. Every type has the, both routines to, it can be represented both as, as a, something that's text and uh, something that's binary. Um, this, for instance, becomes a problem for timestamps because timestamps can be either 64-bit ints or floating point numbers that are also 64-bit long, but, but the interpretation is different. And uh, this is why in parameter status, the server tells you what option it has been compiled with, right? Because if you have a, a working fast 64-bit type, you want date times to be ints. But, but if not, you prefer them to be flows. Uh, in each query, the client can choose if they want the server to give it uh, text or binary data. Uh, and the actual exact format, text format is rather simple because this is what you know, what you see in the console, this is, it's kind of easy. I haven't found a source for, that documents the, the binary format except for the actual C code that, that generates it. <coughs> So I guess it's a way of documenting things. You have your C routines that you can read, but there's no, I haven't found any real reference for driver authors, for instance, to know what's the binary representation of some of the more obscure types. Uh, so let's start with a simple query protocol. 
it's, it is simple. It works like that. The client sends a command. The server replies with a, with a message that says, uh, this is the structure that I'm going to send you. Then it sends a bunch of data or messages of that structure. Then it says, sends command complete, which means your command has, has been <laughs> executed, and then ready for query, which means I'm back at, uh, at the start of the processing loop. You can send more queries. I'm, I'm now waiting. Uh, so que a query is just a query. It's a, it's a string, so we just fire it off. Row description is a bit more complex because uh, it has a number, it's, it's variable length depending on the number of columns that you will be getting. Uh, for each column, you get uh, the name of the column, for instance. So this is, in theory, you could know it, right? Because you wrote the query, you know the column names. But some of the column names are generated, and for this reason or another, the server will tell you the names of the columns that, that will be sent. Uh, it will also tell you a bunch of information about the table that the data is coming from uh, and what's the, what's the actual column of the table. And then it will tell you the type of the thing it's going to send. So it's going to tell you the OID of the type, which means you need to either know the OIDs or query them beforehand if you want to match the OIDs to, to actual payloads. Right? So you need to know that text is 32. If you see 32 here, it means it's going to be text. Uh, then the length, and then the modifier. So like car 16 will have a modifier that says something approximately 16. Uh, and the last byte here, 16-bit integer, is the format, which is zero for text, one for binary. This means that, in theory, every column can be either text or binary. You, you, in theory, you could mix and match. But in the simple protocol, uh, it's always text, except if you use uh, declare cursor binary. Then it's binary. But other than that, it's always text in the simple protocol. And then data row, which is the actual data that's coming down, it's just how many fields, and then field data, field length data, field length data, just, just as that. Uh, command complete is just uh, a string tag, which is what you see in PSQL when you execute something that says insert 01 or select 8000 or something like that. And ready for query is, uh, is the, the identifier and the transaction status. So it can be either idle, in transaction, or, or error. Uh, and why is this useful? Uh, it is useful, for instance, for PSQL, because if you're still in a transaction, you might, PSQL might change the prompt, right? And it knows, because the server tells it, you're still in a transaction. This connection is still in an open transaction. But it's actually very useful for tools like PG Bouncer that look at the protocol, that, that proxy the protocol between the client and the server, and they need to detect whether the transaction is already closed or not. Because if it's closed, depending on settings, it might want to reuse that connection for another client. Right? So it makes it easy for middleware to know if the particular connection has finished its transaction processing and can be repurposed for a different transaction. This only happens in 3.0. In 2.0, the ready for query message does not carry the transaction status. And libpq uh, does some string comparisons to kind of know whether the, the, whether it's, what's the transaction status. And there's this nice comment in, in, the, in the C code which says, uh, by watching for message, we can do a possible job of tracking the status. But this does not work at all on 7.3 servers with auto commit off. Man, was that feature ever a mistake? Caveat user. So uh, for 2.0, you, you can kind of fake it, but it's a, it's a 3.0 feature that, that got added. Now, uh, some of the quirks or features of the protocol is that you can send several commands in one query string. You can send select one semicolon, select two semicolon, select three semicolon, and send them off as one query message. And the server will reply with the one command complete per query, so if you got one command complete and then an error message, you need to figure out, oh, so my second query failed. Uh, there's a, if you send an empty query, you get a, a special kind of response. I'm not really sure why, but this, there's this special concept of an empty response message. So if you just send an empty string, you'll get a special kind of packet. Uh, and it's always text, like I said. Uh, so the simple protocol is simple, right? You send a query. You get the description of the row, 
You get all the rows, command complete, ready for query. That's the simple, this is the simple query protocol. On to the extended protocol. Uh, the extended protocol, uh, apart from being much more complicated, does change some, what, let's say, fundamental things. First of all, the execution is split into stages. It's not like you send one query and then you get the results. There are stages in which you build up the, the, the whole thing. Uh, every step gets a confirmation message from the server, so we do step one, okay, step two, okay, step three, okay, but you can send it all in one without splitting it into separate TCP packets or without waiting, you can just send, all, send it all out and then the server will confirm it all back. So you don't have to do round trips, which would be disastrous for performers. You can just send all the steps and then get, we'll see in the, in the example of how this really works. Uh, it allows separating the parameters from the actual query. So you don't have to send a string. You can send parameters. Uh, why is that? Because uh, typically queries like that in the symbol protocol end up looking like that, uh, which is not something you'd like to see on your server. It also disallows sending several queries. So we can't send uh, select one, semicolon, select two, semicolon. Why? Because the feature of sending multiple queries per, per, per message uh, is usually used to transform queries like that into queries like that. So we don't want that. And in the extended protocol, they would look like that. And that's, this, would be, this would be safe because you wouldn't have to do escaping interpolation, you'd just have a placeholder. So placeholders. Uh, the, the extended protocol starts with a parse message. You first ask the server to parse your query text and prepare the, its execution for you. So we send the parse message, it has a name, it has the, the string query, but it can contain parameters. And then you say, uh, for each parameter, you can tell the server what type will it be. Why is this important? Why would you need to tell the server what, what type the, the parameter will be? Uh, since you'll see that uh, in, the, in the next message, you will specify it again. Because if you have a function like foo, and one version takes an int, and the other version takes uh, text, and you send a query that's foo dollar one, the server will need to know which foo do you mean. So this is where you can disambiguate by, even at the parsing stage, tell the server, okay, this, this first parameter will be an int. Uh, and you can give it a name, so we can reuse it later. If you don't give it a name, which means sending an empty string for statement name, this is the so-called unnamed statement, which is the, it's the default for the rest of the messages. If you never use the name, it's gonna same, always use the last unnamed statement and it's gonna be automatically cleaned when you create another unnamed statement. If you create a named statement from parse, it'll keep a reference to it so we can, as long as the connection lives, it's gonna be there and you will be able to reuse it in, in, the, in future messages. The next step, and this is the complicated step, is bind, which is where you take what parse gave you back, and you, well actually you, you, you take what you sent to parse, the statement name, you refer to that statement by name, and you bind it to an output portal. It, it's called a portal, it's actually the, the identifier of the channel you will be fetching data from, or, or executing on. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a bit complex, right? You have the, you refer to the parse statement by name, or use an empty string if it's the unnamed statement, you give the output portal a name or use an, unknown, uh, an unnamed portal. And then for each parameter, you have uh, whether it's text or binary. Uh, then for each parameter, you have the actual data of the parameter. And then for each result column, you, you tell the server, I want this column in this format. Uh, and that's it. This is bind. Once bind completes, you have the, the query, you have the the output portal ready, and you can start executing on it, uh, but not so fast. There's a message called describe that you can use to describe the, the format of what will be executed. Uh, so if you do parse and bind, you're not really sure which function got chosen, what's the type of the columns, so clients can also send a, a special message that will, that will ask the server, okay, for this parsed statement that I sent to you earlier, what's the output? What, what's, what's it gonna give me? 
and then it tells you, actually, for pars, it's gonna give you what's, what are the parameters it's gonna expect and what's the result of the data is gonna come back. And this is useful, and driver that actually do that to, in order to then interpret the data that's gonna be coming down the wire. So you've, uh, you've parsed the statement, you've bound it to a, to a name that will be your output portal, it's time to execute it. And execute is fairly simple. You just tell it, execute this output portal, and I want at most this many rows. Now, the, the part where it says row limit is the, is the complex part, because if you say, I want 10 rows, and the portal with the query that you're executing actually returns 20 rows, you will get back a message called, uh, it's on the next slide, you'll get back a special message that says, I'm not done yet. Uh, otherwise, you just get a, well, you get a series of data row messages, and then, uh, and then either that message that says, I'm not done yet, or if you're done, then the message that, uh, that says, I'm done. As you can see, no row description is sent, which means that when you do execute, you need to know what data is coming down, because you're just gonna get bytes. You need to be able to interpret them, and that's why drivers usually do a describe before. Uh, so yeah, if the portal has been run to completion, which means you ask for all the rows, for instance, you get uh, a command complete message, but you don't, get, uh, you don't get ready for query because you haven't still closed your extended protocol session, but you get command complete. If not, you get a portal suspended message. Thing is, uh, libpq doesn't even have code to, to, to handle that because libpq and functions you can find in libpq always run the portal to completion. I've tried other drivers to see if they actually were aware of, the, of portals that can get suspended, and only JDBC <laughs> did from the, from the drivers I tried. I tried a Python driver, so PsychoPG only uses the simple query protocol, uh, PyPostgreSQL, which is a Python 3.0 driver, asks for uh, the maximum number of rows, instead of asking for all the rows, which would be sending zero as the row limit, it sends uh, the, the maximum number that can fit in 16 bytes, in, in 32 bytes, which, which doesn't make sense, but they do this. So driver authors sometimes don't really get things right, and it's sometimes useful to look at the, the actual messages that they generate uh, in case you, you're wondering what's, what's going on. Uh, uh, yeah, the, in, in the execute message, you say row limit. There's a 32-bit int when you can say, I want this many rows. If you say zero, it's gonna run to completion. It's gonna send you all the rows. But some drivers, as I, as I said, just send uh, two to the power of 32 minus one. Uh, and I guess, and, and they don't handle suspension. So if you have a table that's humongous and it will generate too much output, they'll just crash with the protocol parsing error, I guess. Uh, and then the last message uh, is sync. So what happens is that you can send all of that in bulk, and only after you send sync will the server start sending you stuff back. This means you can do parse, bind, execute, execute, bind, execute, execute, parse, and then sync, and then the server will send all the confirmations and all the data back. Uh, this is actually useful to sync up on errors because if, if you're an extended protocol, uh, an extended query protocol client, you send a bunch of stuff and then you send sync and then your third statement in the series fails, like with a foreign key violation, the server will know that it should give you an error message for, for that row and then ignore everything until you're sync because you weren't aware that you bombed out there, that there was an error there, and so it, 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 can't, it won't really process all the, the other messages because it, it has errored out. But it will sync up with the client on sync. Uh, and it's also a, a, meaning, a means of uh, reducing network traffic that you can send up a bunch of stuff, and only after you send sync will you get stuff on the network back. Uh, so the extended query protocols work, works like that. You get your queries parsed at parse stage, you get them planned at bind state, and then they get executed at execute. 
And if you have statement logging on, you might see those cryptic lines that say this, these, this many milliseconds parse, this many milliseconds bind. This actually corresponds to parse time, plan time, and actual execution time. So to sum up, the extended protocol works like that. You're a client, you send, parse, bind, describe, execute, sync, and you can all do this in one TCP packet if you choose so. So this is one bunch of data that you send. And then you get back, parse okay, yeah, bind okay, okay. The description for describe, a bunch of data rows from execute, command complete, and ready for query, because you send sync. Now, uh, you could, if you, if you send, if you would like to reuse the, the plan and not incur parsing overhead of, of the, the same query, like if you're, uh, you know, you have your simple select star from post where ID equals dollar one, and you, you want to retain that parsed, uh, the, the, that parse statement and not reparse it for every connection, you can do that. You do a parse sync immediately. It will tell you, okay, it's parsed, your statement is there, and I'm ready for, for more. And then you can do a bunch of bind execute, bind execute, however many you want, sync up, and only then get the, get the response. So this is, and, and again, I, only th I think that only JDBC gets you the level of detail the level of control in order to, to have an execution like that. Most other drivers, uh, even libpq, if you use libpq functions, you can't really have this, this conversation with the server because it'll inject syncs between the bind and the execute because it will sync up or on every execution. You can't really do this with, with, with the C library, which is kind of annoying, but you can't. Uh, I'm not good on time, so I'm gonna, um, hmm. Let's just go through copy really fast, then we're gonna skip the, the less known features, and then the last slide is really fast. So copy is a special state of the protocol. Uh, some commands, like copy from standard input, copy to standard input, put the connection in a special mode that's called copy mode. And in copy mode, the, the expected messages are a bit different. So what happens is that you send copy from standard in, and the server says, okay, I'm ready to, to start copying. And it puts the connection in copy mode. So we get a copy in response that says, uh, this is the number of fields, and uh, these are the formats I expect for them. And then you start sending copy data. Copy data is just a blob, it's just, it's just data. There's no null byte, there's nothing, it's just data, because it's designed for fast bulk transfer. So the client sends all its copy data that it wants, and then it, says that it sends a special message that says copy done, which means go out of the copy processing mode. We're, we're back to normal regular querying mode. And then the, the backend says okay, or it says no, there was an error doing the copy. Uh, if it's the front end that started, uh, I mean, if it's the front end that's receiving the data, you can't really stop. The server will, will, will be pushing data at you until you disconnect or cancel the query. You, you don't have a copy, fail, copy, stop, please don't send me more data. It will just keep pushing data down the, down the wire. So what happens is that you send a normal query, it can be an extended query or a simple query, doesn't matter, and the response is, okay, I'm now in copy processing mode. Then you send all your data, and then you say, okay, I'm done, and the server says, your command, your copy command has completed, and I'm ready for more. So this is kind of a, a protocol inside the protocol. Uh, let's just skip over those, because they're really weird things. Uh, and since we're running out of time, uh, let's go directly to this. The 3.0 protocol, as you've seen, has been working from 6.3, right? Or 6.4, I can't remember, but like over 10 years. And there's been surprisingly few gripes about how bad is it, because it's pretty good, I guess. Uh, even though there, there hasn't been really a lot of push to, to extend it, to change it, you know, to introduce a new version, I've tried to gather some of the things that have been floated on mailing lists uh, to kind of give you a glimpse of where it might go if the project decides to introduce a new protocol version that's not compatible. Uh, so, Compression. 
people were asking to be able to do compression in the protocol itself. Uh, if you're doing bulk transfer, it could be very beneficial to be able to compress traffic and have the, the protocol understand you're sending gzip bytes, for instance, uh, or whatever. Uh, some people argue, oh, you can just use OpenSSL with a null cipher, and it's going to compress. Uh, and the discussion just ended there. Uh, that's not really interesting. The interesting thing is multi-stage authentication. If you recall the auth process, there is no provision for choosing between different authentication mechanisms. The server tells you, give me an MD5 password. And if you'd rather use GSS API, you can't. It's the server that drives it. And uh, the server, you can't say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't. And then the server will go and see, so I have this other method for you. You don't get any negotiation. You just get a challenge. If you don't respond, your, your connection is gone. So this is something that people wanted to, to have, have fallback to different auth methods. A way to actually negotiate the protocol version, because right now it's not really a negotiation. You connect to the server, you send the protocol version, and the server can say, I'm not talking with you, or it can say, yeah, go ahead. I can understand everything that you will say. There's no provision for negotiating, I don't know, extensions or it's, it's, it's very simple. Some people express the need to have inbound query consolidation, which means you, ca you don't need to open another connection to the server and send uh, the cancel request. You can just send it in stream, which is problematic because if your backend is processing data, it will not listen for your messages. They will be left there in the kernel buffer of the receiving machine, and it, they will linger there until the query is done. So we actually usually need to do out of band but still, for, for some things, I guess it would be nice to be able to cancel inbound. And people would like to extend the query message to include GUX, which would mean, I want to execute this query with statement timeout set to one minute. Right? Because right now you have to do set or, say, begin, set local, execute, commit. This is the way you get uh, one of execution of a query that you want to have a a timeout on. And people would say, well, I, I'd just like to attach my GUC directly to the query message so I don't have to mess with transactions and send three, three different you know, uh, queries. And uh, this is uh, the end. If you have questions, we're a bit out of time. So you can do either do this quick or you can just come down here and, uh, and I'll try to answer. Okay, thank you.